I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. Vulture spoke to Cat Williams. Hey, Cat Williams, you talked about not working your material out in clubs. What's with that? Cat said it was a natural evolution. I loved working in the clubs and being a club comic. The part I had a problem with was even though the other comedians were friends, I thought they were funny and I didn't like listening to a lot of their takes on things because it influenced my takes, so I quit. I've been so victimized, like other comedians, by joke thieves and people who let you work out a set for a couple years and then take it from you. They'll take your premise and set up and add a different punchline. It was a wild, wild west. I didn't want to accidentally be involved with any of that on my end. And then later, once I had success, it took me five months to work out material in clubs. I'd be hearing my jokes around the country before I was ready. This comedian from here, this comedian from there, all doing a version of a thing I'm working on. That sucks. From the New York Times, a full article, How Kim Kardashian is Bringing Buzz to Staten Island. Subheading, when the comedian Pete Davidson, a passionate ambassador for the borough, takes the starlight out for pizza, fans follow. People started coming into Campania, a restaurant in Staten Island known for its cold-fired pizza, and asked about Kim. A server there didn't quite get it. I was like, Kim isn't here today, but check back tomorrow. It took me a few times to realize they weren't talking about my friend Kim, who works here with me. They were talking about Kim Kardashian. Word got out about Kim and Pete Davidson's date at Campania, where they skipped out on the truffle mac and cheese and $150 seafood tower, opting instead for a margarita pizza, salad, and sangria. Soon, crowds were swarming the restaurant. One of the managers says, I don't want lines anymore because it's annoying for my customers. We've been busy since we opened last April because our food and service is amazing. We don't even need her. Kim and Pete also went to the movies, Jesse Scarola is the owner of an independent theater near Great Kills. They have 11 screens and arcade games. <laughs> Jesse said, you can't get any bigger than Kim Kardashian. The president could be here and it wouldn't be any bigger, but there would be secret service. When Kim visited over the winter for a screening of House of Gucci, hundreds of people bought tickets or waited in the parking lot for a quick glimpse. What are you all doing? As William Shatner once said, get a life. Christina is a managing director with Bank of America who lives kind of nearby and said some people acted like they didn't care, but they did. People get starstruck and the politicians are involved. Joseph Borelli, councilman of Staten Island, is grateful the Cineplex is getting some attention. The atrium is sort of a throwback to an old era where kids hung out at the movie theater and giggled in the back with their pals. The atrium was crushed during the pandemic. It's good to see their name is in the paper for a good reason. Vincent owns a restaurant and says the area is no stranger to celebrities. There are two studios up the block, one in the old jail, one in the brewery. So we get tons of celebrities. Jim Sarlo is one of the people quoted under the subheading, locals enjoying having some added glamour to their daily lives. Jim Sarlo said, when I go out to have my cigarettes on the rocks by the river, I would see Pete coming out of his condo, which is right next to the museum. I just say, hey, sup? That's what we say on Staten Island. I'm mugging for the camera. What a fabulous article. Billy West. You know Billy West from the best years of the Howard Stern show? Were they the best years? They probably were. He was talking about Gilbert Gottfried. This happened at a convention in Phoenix last weekend. He said Gilbert rebranded tragedy. He was unafraid in the face of horrific tragedy, in the face of cracking someone up, in the face of something horrible. There's plenty of time to figure out what happens and the Phoenix New Times writes, and West was clearly channeling Gilbert when he dulled out a one-two punchline when someone brought up Aquaman. And he said, who's going to replace Amber Heard in the film? Might it be Kevin Hart? I wish I could cut off Kevin Hart's foot and carry it around like a rabbit's foot. All these good things start happening to me. He was asked about a proposed Ren and Stimpy reboot. I don't know how they're going to do it in this climate and suggest that style of comedy might be unpopular nowadays. I guess I'd be offended if I had no life experience at 20. I made a joke about Rush Limbaugh dying. I said he invented high def radio. He was high and deaf. Comedy is subjective. Some things aren't for anyone. It is what it is. Not a target to be shot down. It's easy to shoot from the peanut gallery. I don't care anymore. I'm 70. I don't have to explain. I'll do it. I'll keep coming. No, they don't let me come in anymore. The Hollywood Reporter had a round table with several comedic actors. They asked Bowen Yang. Hey, Bowen, I've heard Lorne Michaels say everyone wants Bowen Yang as a voice of... And that's a lot of pressure on you. How's that weight on you and your choices on SNL and outside of it? Yang said it weighed on me more in the beginning, especially because there was this all important thing placed on these things. And it didn't occur to me that it would be important that an Asian person was on the show because it's thing that people can tell you that you are. Chase said, yeah, it's weird, right? Yang, it's weird. But being an SNL, a uniquely crazy experience for everybody who's there, that makes sense. 
Wait, I'm looking at Will Forte. Che, it's very hard to answer SNL questions when Will Forte is right there. I would report like, Will, I think you said it took you, what, seven years to actually feel confident in SNL? Will said it was five. Then I came in with Fred Armisen, and Fred was immediately able to enjoy himself on stage. I didn't get to that place until season five, but it looks like you guys have so much fun when you're out there. Yang, I still panic, honestly. Che, I've had the worst shows of my life, and I've had really good shows, and the worst shows of my life. And once you have the gamut of experiences, it's like, well, whatever happens, we know we're going to get another show. And then you just panic in the summertime. What do they panic about? Bo and Yang said, it's shallow vanity stuff on top of like, can I deliver the joke that someone stayed up until 5 a.m. on Tuesday writing for me? From the Washington Post, the comedians who broke the glass ceiling and laughed. A review of the book, In on the Joke, the original Queens of Stand-Up Comedy. Lisa Burnback writes, before I started reading In on the Joke, the original Queens of Stand-Up Comedy, I was reasonably sure I was not interested in learning about Minnie Pearl, the country-styled comedian who wore a straw hat with a price tag hanging off the side. I was certain I was familiar with Joan Rivers' bio. I'd never heard of an entertainer named Jean Carroll, but like several of the stars in this book, she began performing her life as a singer-dancer when she added jokes to her repertoire in the 1940s. The term stand-up comic hadn't yet been coined. That would happen in 1950 by Variety, by the way. She was called a comic monologist, and she was famous for being attractive. From a review, Miss Carroll does not hurt her cause by being lovely to look at by enunciating like an elocution teacher. Her timing is faultless and the last follow each other in almost unending succession. The reason Minnie Pearl caught me by surprise, it turns out, is that her persona was completely invented and invested in by one Sarah Ophelia Colley, a graduate of Posh Ward Belmont College, where she was a theater major. She had auditioned for the Opry and was a huge hit on the radio for years, and then she had to figure out what Minnie Pearl would look like on the new medium of television. The costume in which she became famous for was a hastily improvised purchase from a Nashville thrift shop. That's amazing. In on the joke demonstrates how tough the work was, incessant travel, leaving one's family for weeks at a time just to get heckled on stage or fondled backstage. And that doesn't seem so fun. In on the joke, the original Queens of stand-up comedy by Sean Levy. And that is your comedy news for today. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.